getting a feasibility study was really important just in terms of uh, and a feasibility study basically just looks at what you're trying to do and tells you, is this a good idea or are you barking up the wrong tree? Now, all right, guys, welcome to the Big Picture Blueprint. How's it going, Mason? Things are going great. Uh, we were able to have a fantastic conversation with our guest today and really excited to get you guys right to the show very quickly. But Dan, how are you doing? I'm great, man. Busy. Uh, seems like the summer slowdown's over with uh, quite a few lots going under contract to sell here. It's August the 16th. Kids are just going back to school. And so there's a pickup, which is traditionally how it works. Yeah, totally agree. And I'm seeing it on my end. And it also seems to be a little bit of a seller's market as well on the acquisition side, which is nice uh, being able to get more deals and have them move full cycle. And I think a lot of land investors potentially learned about land investing through our guest today. So today on the show, we have Seth Williams, who is the founder of RE Tipster, which is an online community focused on land investing, as well as a lot of other real estate investing strategies. Uh, Seth was the 39th guest on the Bigger Pockets podcast and has been in the land investing and real estate investing space since about 2008. So Seth has done plenty of land deals, has done some funding, uh, has built self-storage units, and we spent a lot of the conversation today talking about industrial outdoor storage, with it, which is a space that I know both Dan and I are very, very interested in. So without further ado, let's bring Seth in. Seth Williams, the legend. How are you doing, my friend? Hey, guys. I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you on the show. Uh was excited to briefly meet you at a conference we were both at a couple months ago, but to dive right in, Seth, what's the worst business-related phone call you've ever received? Yeah, man. Really? Business really? Uh -huh. Gosh, I'm trying to think. Um, you know, surprisingly, I I don't know of any like phone calls specifically where like that's the medium through which I got the bad news. It was usually more like email. an email. Yeah, it can be an email or um, something like that. Yeah, I mean. And it wasn't even, in hindsight, it wasn't even that detrimental. But at the time, I thought the sky was falling. Uh, this was back in, I think, 2019 or so, sometime in that era. when And this was related to RE Tipster. So we had been, uh, I'd been building this website for a long time, and things were going really well. And like Google sent me some super threatening email saying, like, there's a bunch of weird websites linking to you and we don't like that. So you need to go to all of them and tell them to stop linking to you or we're going to totally penalize your website starting now. And I was just like, what, what, what? Like, how do I get another website to stop linking to me? I don't even know how I do that. And it was, uh, I, I thought like my website was done. It was all just going to crash and fall apart. And in hindsight, I, I, uh, you know, I found somebody to help me out with it and we resolved the problem and it never caused any huge issues. But in the moment, I was having like a near panic attack. I thought it was just going to be this horrible thing. But uh, I guess the lesson is, I feel like I've had a lot of moments like that about things that weren't actually that bad in the end. <laughs> so the lesson is, it's okay. Like, oh yeah, nothing is really that bad at the end of the day. Yeah. And that's, that's the beauty of being in the real estate investing, you know, media world as well of it's, it's never quite life or death. And I think that, uh, yeah, it's it's amazing the stuff that can happen, especially in the world of technology of, you know, no identity theft or no, you know, properties getting stolen from you, having done so much and been uh, an online presence for so long. So I want to back up a little bit, which I know you you've got your own podcast and you've been interviewed plenty of times, uh, you know, the famous 39th episode of Bigger Pockets and everything. But Seth, yeah. when did you get started in the land investing space and kind of what was your journey like right at the beginning? Yeah, for me, it was back in uh, 2009. It was kind of like the first direct mail campaign I ever sent out. And it was a really exciting time because I had spent uh, a couple of years kind of floundering around trying to figure out how to buy houses at prices that would make sense or rent them out or flip them and all this stuff. And I just couldn't figure it out. And thank goodness, because like probably wouldn't have gone well for me if I had gotten further along. But I just knew how difficult it was for me to find deals the conventional ways, like looking on the MLS. Like I just couldn't make it work. And uh, at the time in 2009, the market had crashed pretty bad. And I had learned about uh, direct mail to a delinquent tax list for land specifically. 
And that combination of things was a beautiful thing. Uh, it just gave me access to just crazy deals. Uh, I mean, every time I got an acceptance, I just like, my mind was blown. I just couldn't believe anybody would sell properties for as cheap as I was offering. And, um, and I could just kind of do it over and over again. This was long before there was anything called competition in the land business. I mean, everything was just kind of there for the taking and it was amazing. It was an awesome time. And so that was kind of my start to it. And land was the first thing I was ever able to find any success with. Prior to that, I'd tried lots of different things and just couldn't put it together, couldn't make it work, either because I wasn't following the right direction or there was too much competition or I didn't have enough money or something or other. And land was just that perfect blend of things that worked with me. So, yeah. And I, uh, it's always been a part time thing for me. It's never been my full time gig, but I've been plugging away at it ever since then as I have time and doing deals here and there. And, um, it's been a lot of fun. It's been a great way to, you know, build a basically a full time income on a part time basis. So yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, and we'll we'll dive into the current state of your business. Uh, you know, the land side, the development stuff you're doing, and all of the media stuff as well. But Seth, in 2009, uh, I mean, YouTube was new ish. You know, le- you know, half a decade old. Uh, books still existed, believe it or not. But where did you <laughs> where did you learn this strategy of tax delinquent list, direct mail marketing for land, because I got started much, much later and Dan got started sooner, but not, not in 09. Uh, where'd you mm-hmm. even determine that strategy or figure it out, especially specific to land? Yeah, that was, uh, that was all Jack Bosch. He was kind of like a pioneer in the space back at the time. He was the first person I ever knew of to this day, the first person to like really talk about that, that specific strategy. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I owe him for that. If he didn't exist and didn't start talking about that, I'm not sure I ever would have discovered it. And I, I have changed up things quite a bit since those days. I mean, it was like uh, a great way to like discover things and realize what was possible. But, um, you know, as of anything, there's lots of things about it that aren't fun and that are really difficult and kind of things I had to figure out for myself too. But just in terms of that, like initial discovery, that was where I heard about it. Awesome. Makes sense. And I'm glad you said that because so many people paint this picture as if land is just easy all the time. Nothing goes wrong. You monetize your marketing dollars in 30 days, which is just not reality. Sometimes you get deals that quick. Sometimes it's nine to 12 months later. So to to, to that point, and then also to having changed up and adapted and evolved your business these last you know, 15 years, what, what does the land business look like for you today? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I think the land business is kind of harder now than it's ever been, like just in terms of co- competition and uh, prices. And um, I think land sells a lot faster than it did back when I got started. So like there's that going. But, um, but you know, I think one of the original things that attracted me and a lot of other people to it in the first place was uh it used to be there was no competition, and then for a long time there was low competition. And uh, I don't even know if you can say that anymore. It kind of depends on the market, I guess, and what kinds of properties you're going after. But um, yeah, so I think uh, that has kind of changed things in terms of what my business looks like today. So over the past year or two, I've really kind of changed my tune in that um, I used to sort of be against partnering with people. I had had a few bad experiences like over a decade ago. And I just kind of had this chip on my shoulder towards partnerships. And uh, after discovering uh, a really good partner in the self-storage space and also just realizing that I had passed up a lot of really good opportunities in the past with people who would have been good partners and I just hadn't at the time, um, realizing partnerships are actually awesome if you can find a good partner and get into that with confidence. And to just like swear off something because you had a bad experience or two once upon a time is kind of kind of short-sighted really. So um, really in many different aspects of the different businesses I run, and for me, it's kind of about partnerships. That's kind of the way I'm able to do as much as I do. Um, So on the land space, so I'm partnering with uh, various operators to fund deals. I'm also partnering with another operator where he's kind of handling the operations of the business to find the deals. And I'm kind of like the financier and also providing other insights into that. And we're basically partnering on the deals we do together. Um, and then also uh, is kind of like a crossover thing. Um, I'm going after a lot of uh, vacant land properties 
with a very different mentality, with a different strategy than what most land flippers are doing. Um, over the past few months, I've been looking for uh, industrial zone properties with the intent of converting them to industrial outdoor storage properties, which is kind of like a storage facility, but it's um, it's intended for like parking semi trucks essentially. So, uh, and when you are going into a property with that intent to improve it and make it into a cash flowing asset, it changes everything about the types of properties you're going after, uh, where they need to be located, the amount that you can pay for it. And honestly, like you don't even need to buy these properties. You could lease them if the uh, owner is willing to do that with you. In fact, that's almost like a smarter way to do it in the beginning because you don't have to commit to the property to see if it's going to work for that business model. So, um, and also looking for existing storage facilities to buy. That's kind of slowed down as I've been shifting more to this industrial outdoor storage thing. But um, yeah, that's kind of a overview of what I've got going right now. Well, okay, there's... About six things I have on our note sheet here. I'm trying to bookmark from what you just said that I want to make sure we talk about. There. Yeah, sorry, it was a lot. <laughs> no, that was great. That was great. Um, the the first point about the whole conversation around competition, I, I I would say yes, it's gotten dramatically more competitive even since I started in 2019. But much of the competition doesn't know anything about land. They can't speak to what goes into new construction, how it's actually used. They don't follow up, and so. Much of it's just noise, and oftentimes we get deals because the competition leaves such a bad taste in the mouth of sellers, then they come back to us six months later after several failed contracts, and we get the deal. So I wouldn't, if you're listening to this, if you're newer, if that's intimidating to you, if you follow up and take the time to learn what you're talking about, you can still do well in relative to you know, housing or apartment. It's not super competitive. Uh, so I wanted to say that. And then to your point about partnerships, agreed Kind of t twofold there. I, I like your point about not letting one bad experience ruin it. And it sounds like you learned from that and applied it going forward. So you didn't make those same mistakes because partnerships are one of the best ways to leverage. It's just one of the best points of leverage, right? Finding people who are good at what you are not uh, and partnering up with them or just have different backgrounds. You know, Mason and I have very different backgrounds and that really helps in what we're doing. Um, so good points there. And then this outdoor storage is fascinating. That was already on our list to talk about. So let's get into that a little bit. A little bit. Did I understand correctly that you're saying you'll go to an owner, you'll lease their land, and then arbitrage it and set it up for outdoor storage? So it's just a cash flowing asset that you're leasing from someone else. Can you kind of speak more to that? Yeah. Yeah, that's one option. Um, so kind of back up a little bit. I learned about this uh, this concept of uh, semi truck parking lots, and there's there's so many different directions this could go. Um, one way to do it is to set it up as a like a by the night parking lot, which sounds like an Airbnb or truck parking. Uh, the trouble with that, while you can make a lot more money, is that it's a lot more work. Like you need like a, it's just a lot more movement going on, and people come and go really quickly, and. Um, I'm looking for more of a hands-off type thing. So I'm looking for more like the monthly storage where somebody just long-term parks their truck there when they're not using it. And there's all kinds of strategy behind that in terms of how you find the best locations for that and where these truckers are and why they would want and that kind of stuff. But um, originally when I was trying to do this, I was looking for vacant land zoned industrial to do this. And I eventually learned that's actually not the smartest way to go about this because uh, many municipalities, they don't necessarily want these truck parking lots in their area because they're sort of an eyesore. They look ugly. And to convince them that, yeah, I'm going to mow down all these trees and build this hideous parking lot for everybody to see. Um, some of them will do that, but uh, they're going to make you put some kind of a building on there. And the reason they're probably going to do that is because then they can charge you more in tax revenue. Even if you don't need the building, they still want a building there. Um so given that, given that it's hard to convert vacant land to this use, and given that a building will probably have to be there anyway, it makes more sense to kind of reverse engineer this and start by looking for properties that are already zoned industrial for this use, and there's already a small building on the property. And the building isn't really what you even care about. What you care about is a huge parking lot. And when I say huge, I mean like four plus acres of land. Or parking lot, whether it's paved or not, you could pave it if it's not already. And uh, one option is to just buy the thing and you could take that existing building and lease it out to a single tenant. 
And the rest of the parking lot you use for this truck parking thing. Each parking space is essentially a rental unit that they pay you for by the month. You can use the exact same software and setup that you would for a storage facility. You probably want a fence and a gate around it with lights and security cameras and that kind of thing. Um, but uh, another way to, to go at this, and I think a smarter way if you can do it, is you find a property where uh, that owner will also consider leasing it to you. And when you lease it, you'd want to set it up with maybe 10 annual options to renew it. So if it works, you can keep the lease going. They're not going to take it away from you. And with an option to purchase the property. So like if it really starts working, then you can buy it. Um, but even then, you wouldn't even necessarily need to because essentially what you're trying to do is create a little cash flow machine. And you don't necessarily need to own the land to have that. Really what you just need is control of the land. Um, so I think the downside of leasing, if there's a building on there, is that you wouldn't have any depreciation uh, write-off. Um, but if it's a small building, it might not be that big of a depreciation write- write-off uh, anyway. So just kind of depends on the property and situation. So whenever you get these leads, is your strategy to present multiple offers of, you know, say a lower bowl cash offer, kind of a mid-tier-ish seller-financed offer, and then a, you know, m- I don't know, more l- attractive lease option for them? Or how do you structure that initial uh, you know, contract to get the property? Yeah. You know, the seller financing option, that's interesting. Um, I think you certainly could um, if, if it went to that direction. Usually what I've been doing is I kind of start by looking at it from the standpoint of like, would it make sense to buy this? Like if I got a commercial loan with the going rate and 20-year amortization and that kind of thing, uh, and given how big this property is and how many parking spaces I can fit on there, you can usually fit about 20 par- uh, parking spaces per acre. And in my market anyway, like in Michigan, I could probably charge about 150 bucks per month. Some markets down south, you can charge a lot more per month. Um, but just kind of taking those different assumptions and plugging it in and comparing that to the price. Like, does it cash flow if I buy the thing? And if there's any uncertainty about the location, say like, uh, for example, uh, a really good uh, ideal location for this is to be, you know, less than a mile away from a major highway or a major thoroughfare where semi trucks are going by regularly. So, say if this was like two miles from there, I'm like, I don't know. I mean, maybe that's fine, but I'm not totally sure. I don't know if I want to sink $700,000 into this thing to maybe have it work out. Like, it'd be easier to just commit to like a $50,000 annual lease for one year. And then if it totally tanks, I'm not stuck with this property. Um, so that's when I would kind of go down uh, that route. Or if somebody is intentionally trying to just lease it out, we could start there too. But uh, if it were to be leased, it would have to be set up with that option to renew and preferably the option to purchase the thing. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I think I'm getting excited because I, I remember reading an article on the beach like a year and a half ago called in- iOS, Industrial Outdoor Storage, the $200 billion mm-hmm. market that no one's talking about. Um, and I'm excited to talk about it with you, Seth. And yeah. I, I wrote this and wrote this down. Did you say 150 per month per vehicle that's parked there? Yeah, that's. Uh, I mean, a bit of this is mark market dependent, and this is actually, I've found one of the biggest challenges in this space is there are no real comps out there, or at least in my market. Um, I shouldn't say that. There are comps, but they're very hard to find. They don't advertise themselves. It's like you kind of have to know somebody who knows somebody to be able to park there. Um, And when you find them, they're usually completely full, even though they're not advertising at all, Uh, which tells you there's a lot of demand for this. And that's another thing I've found is this truck parking issue is a problem everywhere. Like in every market, there is a shortage of it. In some markets, it's so bad that truckers are literally like, parking on the side of the highway because there's nowhere to go. Because when you think about it, a trucker can't just pull up to Starbucks or a normal gas station. Like they need a special place that's meant for their kind of truck. And Walmart, you could go there. You're not supposed to, but you could. And a lot of times that's the only option. That's kind of why you see those those truckers there. So um, it, it's the bluest ocean I've seen maybe ever, but definitely since I first discovered land, it reminds me a lot of that in that... Um, Part of the reason why it's so blue is because these things are kind of hard to set up because a lot of municipalities don't want them there. And also, like, as I'm going through this process of trying to find comps and 
understand for sure what could I rent this for per month. It's hard to find comps, and I remember the land used to be exactly like that, where it was really hard to know with any certainty what a property was worth because the comps weren't there. So this lack of information is kind of a barrier to entry for everybody, which essentially means if you're willing to deal with that risk, you're going to sort of have the playing field to yourself. That's fascinating. And I, I think, um, you know, potentially we can kind of dive into this, Dan, from the top down where Seth, you know, you mentioned you need a fence, gate, you know, ideally some security cameras and stuff like that. But in terms of the actual improvements necessary to make it into an industrial outdoor storage so these truckers can, uh, you know, park on it, obviously it needs to be relatively level, but what kind of dirt work or fill is needed to make it so where you've got these huge, heavy trucks coming in, you don't want you know, potholes and stuff collapsing. How much does it cost to, you said four, four plus acres, let, you know, how much does it, would it cost to take a piece of dirt and convert it to that, assuming it's, you know, relatively flat topography there? Yeah, a lot of it has to do with what kind of dirt is there already, like what the, the load bearing capacity of it is, which you can find out back in a geotechnical investigation which is something I didn't even know existed until I built my storage facility. But uh, so back when I did that, it was 6000 bucks just for them to drill holes in the ground and tell me what kind of soil was there. Um, so depending on, you know, how how dense it is and if it's going to sink in or not, uh, I believe it's like anywhere from 12 to 18 inches of gravel, if you're going to do gravel or some kind of base to just like, you know, be thick enough that a semi-truck sitting on it is not going to create these huge divots. Uh, and it may be even thicker than that, honestly, depending on what, what's under there. But um, it's a fair amount of uh, dirt work, honestly. And it, it can get kind of expensive. Like we were looking at um, one over in uh, the Detroit area, I think paving or um, putting gravel on like four acres of it. And I think the cost was, it was a huge range, but it was like two hundred six hundred thousand dollars $600,000 just to put gravel there. So it's not cheap to do that. Um, but uh, the other thing to think about though is, uh, sometimes you can find locations where like there's already a parking lot there. So like you don't have to do any of this stuff. Like it's it's there. Or it's just not being used. Like pretty much any time you drive by an industrial area and you just see unused parking, like bingo, that's an ideal spot for it, assuming the zoning allows for it. Um, and also, if you wanted to, you could do like class C uh, storage like this where people just park in the grass. You don't do anything. And it's, it's kind of, you know, I mean... You probably wouldn't be able to charge as much for that because it just looks and feels like undeveloped. But if you just had nowhere else to start and you didn't want to spend any money, some people do that too. Interesting. Okay. This is this is a fascinating model. I, I kind of chuckled when you described how hard it is to comp, how you know these aren't well advertised by owners. Sounds like it's totally non-consolidated. All of these are factors that remind me of the most profitable land markets I've ever been in, where it's a pain in the butt, but there's yeah. consumer demand. There aren't a lot of competent players, right? The market is inefficient. I see people complain about that sort of thing where, oh, it's hard to pull the data or it doesn't show up on PropStream. Well, the more difficult it is, the more of a blue ocean it tends to be. And if you go deal with that pain in the ass, you can make quite the return. And that's a really important concept. Yeah. Um. So, okay. You've set it up. You've done the dirt work. You mentioned that you can't find comps because nobody's advertising these. So where are you getting clients and, and signing leases? How does that whole process work? Yeah. Well, um, so I guess a few different things on that. In terms of uh, how you kind of assess what the demand is. So uh, when you're doing this kind of monthly uh, truck storage thing where people are paying by the month, so your ideal tenant is going to be a small trucking company where that has like 20 trucks or less, maybe just like a guy who has one truck and he needs a place to park it. That's kind of going to be your ideal uh, tenant. Sometimes you'll find, um, just talking to other people who do this in different parts of the country, sometimes you'll find, hey, Amazon needs a place for 20 trucks. So they'll just randomly do it too. But but they're probably not going to be the ones you depend on because they're probably going to have their own parking. Um, so the idea is you want to find, okay, where did these truckers live? And I don't know that there's like a bulletproof way to know exactly where that is. But one thing to keep in mind, I've learned this stuff after reading lots of different industry reports and that kind of thing. But uh, a lot of truckers, what they have to do if they're in this situation is they find this place to park their truck, wherever that is, whether it's legal or not. 
And it's anywhere from like 20 minutes to like 50 minutes, maybe even an hour away from where they live. And then they have to go drive home and, you know, with a normal car. When it's time to go on another trip again, they drive to the truck parking place, park their car, get in their truck and go somewhere else. So, you know, I would say you'd want to be like figure out where these people are and try to make that facility within maybe a half hour drive of that, maybe 20 minutes, ideally. So big population centers, uh, a lot of times big cities like Houston, Dallas, Atlanta, Detroit, you know, it's a bridge to Canada, like tons of traffic coming over from Canada, that kind of thing. Like those are ideal places, but really uh, I've heard stories from people who put these things up like kind of in the middle of nowhere and it still works out as long as they have the pricing right and they're able to make people aware that they exist. Uh, you might not be able to have like a massive parking lot with like 500 spots, but if you just have space for like maybe 10 or 20 trucks, like that might fill up just fine. So I actually did an interview with... um Evan Shelley, he's the owner of uh, truckparkingclub.com. They have a, a mobile app and a website that's designed around this whole industry and got a lot of interesting insights from him because he can actually see a lot of the data for their customers that use their management software. So he kind of sees like how much are they charging, what's their occupancy rate. And it's pretty interesting uh, just to hear like what kinds of properties work for this and what locations and what people are charging and able to get for it. Yeah. Wow. Okay. There's there's a lot there. So it sounds like if it's in the right location, the demand's there. It kind of sells itself as far as leasing. Uh, I'll be curious in in yeah. five or ten years, as more and more people get word of this, as it becomes more efficient. If that's still the case, or if it becomes more competitive, or what happens there? Because you know we kind of saw a consolidation with self storage with mobile homes, um, yeah. and maybe it won't happen in this space. It could remain as is. Um, now you've got it. Let's say you've got it set up. You've got it leased. You did that right. You know, when I think truck stop, I guess this isn't an overnight stop, so that eliminates some of the uh, uh, bad connotations that come with overnight truck stops. So this is long term. Yeah. But what does the operation look like? What are the potential pain, pains that come up or, or challenges? Yeah. Well, um, so from from what I know, and this is partially coming from the self storage industry, but also just having lots of conversations with other people that have facilities like this. Uh, some of the pain points might be, um, I guess, depending on what kind of uh, parking lot you have. Some people will do concrete, which is obviously more expensive. But if you're doing gravel, uh, it can be surprisingly tricky to like mark off spots and say, here, here is a parking spot. Because if you paint lines on there, the lines will just, you know, the paint goes away. It doesn't last. So it's kind of interesting trying to find a way to like clearly designate where people should go. And some people just don't do it. And as a result, their parking lots are kind of a mess with people just parking all over the place. Um, I've also heard issues with uh, a lot of times what truckers will do is they'll like uh, do their oil changes on site and leave like cans of used oil around or like, you know, burnt out tires or just toss them there. Or maybe a truck that has flat tires and it's not operable. And that just kind of starts to make it look like a junkyard. Um, so there's different, I mean, those are some like the management issues you might have to think through. Um, and, you know, whenever you get a gate involved, this is true of self-storage too. The gate is usually the number one maintenance issue. And it's kind of a huge problem if it stops working. Because like somebody could get stuck in there. Or somebody, maybe they need this stuff right now. Or maybe if they have a uh, a truck that has a refrigerated load in it, like this is all going to go bad in like a few hours. I got to get out of here, fix the gate, <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, so is that kind of stuff. Um, but it, back to your uh, earlier point though. So like on, on the advertising front, so um, I, I've seen a few different uh, uh, facilities or, you know, parking lots like this in the Nashville area that have pretty good websites that ex you know, clearly explain what the place is and what the parking layout is and all that. But most of the ones I've seen don't even have that. It's just pretty much the only thing they rely on is a Google business listing just to let the world know, hey, if I Google truck parking near me or something like that, they'll find you. And that's it. Um, and it's, I think it's, it's just another sign of like how immature and inefficient this particular niche of real estate is. Like it's just, it reminds me so much of land 15 years ago. Like people just have not, figured anything out yet and uh, there's a lot of improvement and opportunity there yeah I, I think that's all great it's it's really exciting i mean um on powers road in colorado spring there's two own rv and truck storages and they are 
absolutely entirely full. Uh, you can't find the businesses online. Um, it's just, you know, a big phone number right there and it's uh, across a busy thoroughfare. Um, on this and related to self-storage, because I, I do want to talk about your self-storage build that, you, uh, yeah. that you've just done. Um, I think there has to be uh, some benefit of having the direct-to-seller marketing business where you're able to go out and get some of these leads rather than having to engage a commercial broker and hop on loop and then look at all these on-market properties. How do you feel like, you know, um, all right, I guess a, a multi-part question here. Are you having partners on these uh, industrial outdoor storage and self-storage project? And then two, how much value do you think it brings to the table being able to go direct to seller and potentially find these properties are off market and you're able to establish a higher basis than what you would for a typical land flip, but you're not necessarily at market value, which makes it a uh, more appealing pro forma. Yeah. Um, so I guess that, uh, that question there about being able to find people off market. So yeah, I certainly know how to do that. And one little secret weapon that I've learned on that, when I first started trying to find existing self-storage facilities to buy, um, I did it wrong a couple different ways. Uh, one was I tried to get onto like data tree and filter it that way. And the problem is once you start going to multiple counties, different counties sort of classify those properties a different, and it may not even classify it at all. Like you might just be, have to search for like warehouse space, which includes self-storage and 10 other types of properties. So it's not really whittling down to self-storage owners. Another way I tried to do it was like, just getting on Google Maps and searching for self-storage and like handpicking every single one. And uh, that worked, but it was super time consuming, not efficient at all. Um, but there are a couple companies out there that it's literally their entire business to know where every single self-storage facility is, how many units they have, how many square feet they have, all this stuff. Uh, the one that I've been working with is called Store Track, And uh, it's awesome. Like you can basically get exactly the list you want you know exclude certain types of f facilities if they're too big you know define exactly the radius around whatever location you're looking for so if you want to send out like direct mail and find them that way that's the best way i know how to do it the other one is radius plus which i think is basically the exact same thing i've just never worked with them in that capacity but uh store track for sure can make it way easier to like just get exactly the properties you're looking for and nothing else um what was your uh, other question again? Your first one you were asking? I can't remember what you said. Yeah, no, I, I I think that answers it. It's just the the blend of being able to bring that direct to seller marketing experience and knowing that there's list providers out there and that you can source it, you know, either through direct mail or cold calling or wh wh whatever marketing medium makes the most sense. But um, and yeah. then being able to add that value to the partnership beyond just total operations of the deal of being able to ideally get these uh, assets or this land at a discount, but Seth, let's yeah. dive into your uh, storage facility that you shared about at that conference. Um, talk to us high level, where it is, how much land it was, the structure of the deal on the acquisition, the costs, uh, the anticipated cash flow depreciation, uh, everything that we can, and we'll break it down. Yeah. Yeah. I've actually got a video I just put out a couple of weeks ago going over most of this stuff. Um but it's called like the financial walkthrough of my storage facility or something. If you go to the RE Tips or YouTube channel, but uh, just to kind of recap a lot of that. So uh, the property was a 6.7 acre parcel of land that I found. It's about a, a 20 minute drive from where I live. And um, that ended up being, I don't know if it's vital, but it sure is helpful when you're building something from the ground up, just because you can like get there if you need to. Uh, Dan, you probably know about that. It's just, um, it's just nice. Like there's a thing that has to get taken care of right now. Somebody's got to get out there and I can do that. Uh, if it was like three hours away, that would be harder to do. But, um, and yeah, so the, uh, originally when I, uh, started doing this, I got some consultants to help me out, which I think was really helpful just because I'd never done this before. And there's a lot of stuff. Like, I don't even know what I don't know. I don't even know what questions to ask. I kind of get it. Like I've taken a few courses, but like, I know from experience, that's just, uh, it's a helpful starting point, but like the real learning starts happening when you start screwing stuff up. And I didn't really want to screw a lot of stuff up. So, uh, but they helped me kind of understand like what's normal. And like when I was getting quoted on prices for the buildings and stuff like this, they could say, yeah, that's too much. We're like, oh, it's a good deal. 
Or you might want to think about this, you know, using these size units because of this, because there's already these kinds in the market. You want to have something different you can offer. Um, and uh, getting a feasibility study was really important just in terms of, uh, and a feasibility study basically just looks at what you're trying to do and tells you, is this a good idea? Or are you barking up the wrong tree? Like, um, you, know, you know, you kind of provide them with some basic information about how much you want to spend, the basics of what you're trying to build. And they will look at all the other competitors in the area and figure out how occupied they are and what they're charging for their units. And then kind of make suggestions on what you should do and how much you could charge based on what the other people are doing in your market. And even putting together like a full cost estimate on what they think it's going to cost to build the whole thing. And that was super helpful. I had already done a lot of this information on all that uh, research on my own, uh, but just having them do it and confirm or deny that I was on the right track was really helpful. Um, and I don't think what else, um, the, uh, the consultants I was working with, they said they usually don't recommend people build anything new unless they're going to build at least 50,000 square feet to start with yeah, which I was like, wow, it's kind of a lot. Um, like I was looking at doing like maybe a quarter of that amount, not, not that big. And, uh, so knowing that I was like, I don't really want to go four or five million dollars in debt on something where this is my first go around and I don't know what I'm doing. Like I'd, I'd love to just kind of make this more bite size and start off smaller. So I decided to start with uh, 27,600 square feet and basically break it up into two phases. So this first phase was going to be those four storage buildings. And then the other half of the property was going to be an RV boat storage parking lot. And, you know, once everything fills up a few years from now, we would then do phase two and build out the rest of the buildings. So that's kind of the, the stage that we're in right now. And uh, it's been open for a little over a year and we are a little over half occupied now and we're about at that breaking even point. So um, yeah, three years into it, like three years since I decided to buy the property and start building and just now I'm not losing money. <laughs> so it took us that long. It's okay. That, that, tends to be the way it is with these uh, new construction projects you're keeping, especially when it gets a little more complex, like with what you're doing. But something I wanted to pull out of what you just said is that you pay consultants, you paid for courses. And I think that's really important where the longer I've just been in business, it, I want to shorten the learning curve with anything and everything I'm doing more than anything else. And I'm willing to pay for that, right? I wanted to set up my first mid midterm yeah. rental, I paid a consultant. It made it so easy, right? And so I, I think that's important for our listeners to hear because there are big potential mistakes that could have been made in in that development, especially at that level you're playing where paying whatever, you know, a few thousand or maybe tens of thousands to a consultant makes a lot of sense if you can make yeah. sure you don't make those mistakes and you don't get delayed by months or even years if you make small mistakes because you don't know what you don't know. So just want to highlight that, you know, put your ego aside like you did when you're pursuing new things and find the experts you can learn from. Uh, and then to that end and, and continuing along the whole conversation, I'm curious, how do you look at the self storage? And what I mean is, so in my business, I see the land business as my cash printing machine, my way to multiply the wealth to then continually buy and hold more nice assets, which are really just, I think of as my 401k for 10, 20, 30 years ago, maybe I'll pay them off. Maybe I'll trade them in the other assets, but I kind of bifurcate my business that way. Uh, how do you think about it? Is the self storage meant to be cash flow in the near future? Is it for down the road? What What's the big picture? Yeah, no, I, I'm on the same page with that. I think the land business is a great way to have that cash generating machine. Um, it's great for so many reasons, as I'm sure we all know. Um, for me, it was kind of, uh, um, you know, it was becoming a hamster wheel, essentially, which I think it. Some people love the hamster wheel and more power to them if they want to do that the rest of their life. But for me, it was just like, you know, I kind of want the ability to take my foot off the gas and the money's still going to come in. And I don't have to like always be looking at the next deal. And I think part of what's going on there is uh, I've heard the analogy. There's the hunter mentality and there's the farmer mentality. And the farmer mentality, that's kind of what I am. Like I'm okay with slow, monotonous things. I'm okay with it taking forever to start working. I'm loyal to the process. But really what I'm after is like long-term predictable income. Whereas the hunter is more excited by the thrill of the chase and going after the next deal. Like they love that. Uh, and for them, I think land flipping is perfect because that, that's exactly what they want to do anyway. Um, 
So, but I'm not necessarily the hunter, uh, but it was a, a great means to an end in terms of just like being able to make that money and put it into something else. Uh, and ultimately, I think even if somebody is a hunter, I still think it's pretty uh, prudent to be finding ways that allow you to get off the hamster wheel at some point if you want to. Like, um, you never know when like, the business is going to change or the market's going to change or who knows? All kinds of weird stuff can happen. You could, you know, lose your health or something could happen. And it's great to have something else that's just going to work, even if you don't want to do land anymore. And for me, that's what self-storage is. Uh, that's what this truck parking idea is. You know, I've been looking at uh, triple net lease uh, possibilities too. That's probably like the third thing down on my list at this point. But um, basically finding something that's going to be a long-term predictable source of income, or at least as predictable as you can make it. Yep. No, a absolutely. That's the same way I think about it. I think that is important. And I'm glad you said you never know the business model could change. You know, so many people in South Carolina are, are struggling because they just made wholesaling illegal, right? You never know when something like that will happen, something you've never considered, you know, black swan sort of event. Uh, and so being ready to pivot and, you know, ahead of time already maybe starting or, or setting up other hedges is really important. But we really want to pivot the conversation here because it's, it's uh, already 15 uh, till the end of the hour. So, Let's talk about REI Tipster, the content you're doing, social media. You've built yourself quite a brand, you know, one of the longest or longer running podcasts within real estate and definitely land that I've ever seen. What has been, or, or talk to us about that. What has been uh, as you expected? What has all come from that beyond the obvious, you know, direct benefits, positives, negatives? Kind of speak to that a little bit. Yeah. Well, uh, in terms of like why I even started doing it, um, I, I didn't even really realize this until I started doing it, that uh, I really enjoy the uh, content creation process. Like it's, I could just do it all day. Like it's a lot of fun for me. And uh, having been in the business for a number of years before I started Ari Tipster, I just realized like there's a lot of stuff I've learned here. And, uh, you know, having talked with a lot of different people on, in forums who were dealing with similar issues that I had been through, I just realized like, I've got the answer for him. Like I can totally make this problem go away. And it's fun for me to take those complicated issues and break them down so anybody can understand them. And uh, when the podcast started, that was a number of years after retipster.com started, um, I realized that was a lot of fun too. Like talking with a lot of guys like yourself and just getting tons of great ideas that I'd never have on my own and trying to extract a lot of expertise out of other people who were doing different things. Uh, and it's, it's just been awesome. And I think it kind of goes back to my, you know, the farmer mentality. Building a blog or an online community is a very, very slow process. And if you, you're somebody who wants quick results, like you're going to really struggle with that because it's not going to happen. It was well over a year before I even made a penny from Ari Tipster. Uh, and it uh, it's one of those things where I'm okay with that. Like I enjoy the work and I'm fine doing the long slog to have something that's predictable and beneficial for a lot of people and it's been a ton of fun i still can't wait for monday mornings because i love this work and it's a privilege for me to do it that's fantastic um with you've got youtube you've got the podcast you've got the blog what do you feel like within those brings you the most business and it could be you know potential coaching clients it could be deals it could be investors which do you feel like is the most effective at this point in 2024 yeah, it's a good question. Uh, all of those platforms, the the podcast, the blog, the YouTube channel, other social media outlets, they've all changed a lot over the years. Like they don't work the way that they used to be, which is kind of frustrating because, uh, I mean, first of all, it's hard to change just humans in general. Um, but also it's hard to change when you don't know what you need to change. Like, uh, you know, with all these social media platforms, including YouTube, it used to be that if I subscribe to somebody, I'm going to see whatever they publish. And that's not how it works anymore. It's like when I get on YouTube, a lot of the stuff I see that YouTube is serving up to me, I don't subscribe to them. Maybe I liked another video that talked about a similar thing, and now they think I want to hear about this other thing that's kind of related. Um, and honestly, like they do a great job. Like I, every time I log in, I see all kinds of stuff that looks super interesting. So like it works, but um, I think the way it's YouTube has changed, for example, is that 
uh, it used to be that video was kind of a novelty, like just watching a video at all on the internet was like, whoa, like, I can't believe I'm watching a video right now. And now it's like, you better really entertain me in the first 10 seconds or I'm gone. And it's, uh, you know, to have somebody sit down and watch like a 30 minute long screen share video is hard unless you're doing something really interesting that they really care about. Um, and you know, I can't even say I'm really that good at this. Like I still make those kinds of videos just cause that's, that's how I know how to explain things. But, um, but, uh, in terms of like what brings the most business, uh, I don't really know, to be honest with you. I think YouTube is kind of a big deal in, in one regard, but interestingly, there are certain avatars of people in our audience who like, they will only ever listen to the podcast and that's it. Like if it doesn't hit the podcast, they're never going to hear what I have to say. So I just kind of learned that if there's something that everybody needs to hear, like put it on every possible platform, make it so that everyone will see it. And even then people still probably will miss it, but at least you'll have a better chance of hitting everybody. Yeah. And Dan, Dan and I are at, I guess, an interesting point. And, um, you know, like kind of like you mentioned, uh, one of our favorite things about the podcast is just being able to have interesting conversations with interesting people and uh, yeah. get free consulting advice while we're at it. Um, so we we really stayed away from looking at any of the analytics of our show on Spotify or Apple or YouTube or anything like that. How much are you using the data that's available within all of the media influence spheres and uh, platforms that you're operating to guide your decision making with the content that you're putting out of, okay, this 30 minute screen share video got 1500 views. I'm going to keep doing that versus, you know, this other, you know, I don't know. I think one of our most popular ones was like Dan talking about bailing his contractor out of jail or something, you know, the entertaining stuff, mm -hmm. like it's that edutainment or whatever you want to call it. How much decision-making comes from the data that's available? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, yeah. I, yeah. It's a great question. I, I think if I was smarter about it, I would pay a lot more attention to that and like notice the things that take off and do really well and do a lot more of that. My problem is, uh, I think what people need to hear, it's not always like the thing that pops off and everybody goes crazy about. Like there's some stuff that's important that may, may not be super clickable or exciting or, uh, hit all the algorithms just right. So I, I try to make sure I'm at least hitting all those bases, but then like, uh, for example, if I see that like a particular topic is done really well, it's like, okay, well, there's probably five other, at least related things I could say about that, that would kind of either lead into that or be the, another thing they could watch after that that they also need to know about um and i, I think it's weird because it i think the data totally matters and it's important to pay attention to that but at the same time like it is such a labyrinth that you're going to get lost in years ago i you know paid for a couple different seo tools to try to figure this stuff out and boil it down to a science and i, I learned that it does kind of give you some ideas but like just because like this other person did a piece of content about this topic doesn't mean it's going to take off when I do it because maybe I'm not as good as explaining it as, as they are. Maybe I'm not as, you know, good looking or, uh, you know, I can't uh, say something as clever as them or, you know, it's, it's really hard to pin down, you know, what it is exactly that's making something work. Sometimes it's just like the thumbnail image, you know, but, um, yeah. So I guess I, it's kind of yes and no. I do pay attention, but I don't like obsess over it. Yeah. I think it's, um, Whenever it becomes boring or not fun, it gets really hard to do. Uh, whenever you start yeah. putting too much thought behind it, of you're like, okay, this is probably making me money, but I'm operating real businesses that's making me money. I have fun doing it. I think the podcast is one of the most fun aspects of the business that we get to run, just having these conversations. And there's so much better we could do with better titles, better thumbnails, better editing, all that kind of stuff. But then you go down this rabbit hole and I don't know if anyone watches Rick and Morty, uh, but he, you know, creates this store in Rick and Morty to compete against this guy. And there's a scene where he's like dealing with HR issues and dealing with accounting issues and payroll and stuff. And he's like, you know what? Screw it. I'm done. And that's sometimes how the rabbit hole of social media and content creation can, can, and, uh, does go because there's consultants out there that could figure it out for us and charge us 15 grand a month to make it so we're, we're the best podcast on the internet, but it's, then it, it, I don't know, it loses the allure that, uh, initially I think brought, uh, at least the three of us into this content creation space, but I'll pass it to Dan as we move towards the top of the hour. 
Yeah, and and one thousand true fans by Kevin Kelly is worth reading for anyone that has not read that. Uh, conceptually, the idea is, you know, my my reel that got thousands of views was probably not a lot of people who would actually be investors or clients or partners. Whereas if you only get 50 views, but all 50 views are wealthy business people or investors, well, you might only need those 50 people to view your content. And so having the right audience, the right avatar, really targeting them is very, very important. And sometimes, you know, there's vanity metrics of how many views did I get? Well, if it's 50,000 13-year-olds watching your video, you're not going to get much business out of that. Uh, so <laughs> anyways... You know, moving towards the end here, I guess the last question I'd ask Seth on the topic of content, having done your podcast for what I, I believe a decade plus or maybe 12, 12 years, any advice you would give to us only being a year in anything, whether it's being selective with guests or how you go about doing it, any thoughts at all you'd like to share? Yeah, interesting. Uh, actually, the podcast, uh, I started in 2019. Uh, Ari Tipster started in 2012, okay. uh, but the podcast was kind of, I actually put it off for a long time because I, I didn't feel confident about my ability to just like talk for a long time. It was a weird mental uh, limiting belief. But anyway, um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of what I've seen, um, so I get I get reached out to every single day by multiple people pitching themselves to come on our podcast. You guys probably get that too, I'm sure. Uh, and I've got a very kindly written uh, email queued up that I send them that just says, no thanks, uh, without saying it. It's more like, you know, appreciate it. We're going to add you to our list. We'll reach out if we need you, that kind of thing. Um, and the reason I do that is because like, they just don't really interest me. Like they have all this funny, you know, cool, exciting stuff to say about themselves, but like, it's just not, clicking with me like I, I don't care and it's hard to fake that i care when i don't so it's more of uh i'm reaching out to people that don't have a following at all they don't have a book to sell or a course or anything like that they're just normal people that i know have been doing really cool things and maybe they're just like a couple steps ahead of everybody else but they still have something everybody can learn from because that's where you get like real conversations with people that are going to tell you the truth rather than just like this is what i want you to think so that you'll follow me and do what i tell you to do it's more like I've got nothing to sell you. Like, this is just my real experience. I'm sorry if that doesn't sound good. This is really what happened to me. Um, and I, I think those are just awesome conversations, especially when I can think of the, the most important relevant questions to ask them. And then also when they can answer honestly, that's when the magic happens. And uh, yeah, I, I, it's almost counterintuitive because I think a lot of times podcasters almost try to get people with a huge audience so that they can kind of like, you know, get noticed and I don't know, which is totally fine. But, um, I've, I've not really done that. And, and I think in some ways that's kind of hurt me because I, I think my phone probably could be bigger if I was constantly trying to go after huge people and get them on a po the podcast. But, uh, I just find the, the real people more interesting. So that's kind of how I do it. I don't know if you want to take that advice or not, but that's my, my I take. I like on. that because every episode I've listened to of your show is very tactical. It gets granular. It gets into the details. It's not just the high level, huge numbers. And yeah. I, I really like that. It's actually, you can get real tactical advice from listening. So no, that, thank you for that. Yeah, thanks. Um, well, moving towards the end here, Seth, uh, I would ask where can our listeners find out more about you, share anything and everything about what you're doing, what, what, how they can participate and get in touch yeah, sure. So if you want to go to retipster.com, that's probably like, that's the main home base where everything is. Uh, if you're on any social media platform, just search for retipster and you'll find our groups and pages and profiles and all this stuff. And you're welcome to follow us there. I'd say I'm probably most active on Facebook just because we've got a Facebook group there that is super active. I don't necessarily love Facebook, but that's just where the action is. Uh, so that's probably where I spend the most time, but uh, you search for Ari Tips or wherever you're at, you'll probably find our stuff. Awesome, Seth. And I know you're always interviewing people. What is one question that we did not ask you that we should have asked you as the interviewee this time? Yeah, probably. Do you guys know who um, Sean Evans is? The name sounds familiar. Is that? Yeah, he. Uh, He's got the podcast where they uh, do the hot wings and he interviews oh, yeah, uh, yeah, celebrities yeah. and that kind of thing. Yeah, I've got so, hot sauces in my fridge. Yeah. So 
he's known for asking really, really good questions where he like deeply researches people. One of the questions I heard him ask a while back was, uh, I forgot he was, who he was talking to, but he said, what's something that you think people talk too much about? And what's something that you think people don't talk about enough with regard to your thing? Um, so, and I've been asking that question lately of a few people that I've interviewed and, um, give, and give us if you were going to ask me that question <laughs> about, uh, about real estate or land in general. So I think, uh, in terms of what people talk about too much, it's probably, um, you know, the big success stories and showing pictures of the checks and look how awesome I am. And, you know, my life is amazing. That kind of stuff. I totally get why people talk about that. And there's a place for that for sure. I mean, it's important to see success stories and understand how people did that. Um, but, uh, I think sometimes that overshadows like the real struggle behind it and like, this business is really hard. Sometimes it's hard enough that some people quit and never figure it out. Like there is a possibility of failure. And just cause this one guy did something to get this check doesn't mean that's going to work in my market or with my personality. Like maybe they have some skill I don't have basically just being real about the things that are really difficult and challenging. And, um, and, and I think sometimes like, uh, and I, I, I'm probably guilty of this too. Honestly, we, we talk about the good stuff on my podcast but we like don't really drill down deep enough to like what went wrong. Like, would you would you ever feel like you had to quit this business? Like, you know, what are you most ashamed of, or what, what was the hardest thing about this for you? Because that's like where some of the biggest lessons are is just those really difficult moments. And um, yeah, I've I almost thought about like having an episode where we just talk about like all the worst things that have ever happened to us. But I feel like that'd be like a really negative <laughs> episode. <laughs> but the hell? I think there's a lot of lessons there. Yeah, <laughs> that was fantastic, Seth. Uh, we appreciate your transparency, your humility, and just all of the knowledge and insights you were able to give us on land, uh, self storage, industrial outdoor storage, and you know, creating a blog, YouTube channel, and a podcast that talks about all the topics we care about. So, this is Mason McDonald and Dan Habercross with the Big Picture Blueprint signing off. <laughs>